probably you'll find a job there. Now, some of these agencies are also useful, but others are merely established as a sign of moral and political posturing, like the Agency for Fundamental Rights. Let there be no doubt, ladies and gentlemen, I am a strong supporter of fundamental rights. But the Council of Europe is already dealing with this issue, and now the European Union starts doing the same thing. So there is already a Convention for Human Rights and a court located in Strasbourg. Now, we do not improve Europe by duplicating its work. And then there's another phenomenon, is uh, the President of Europe. I wonder whether he is really needed. He pretends to epitomize a leading role. A European President is just another President in Europe, like the President of the Commission, the President of the European Parliament, and the government leader of the country which holds the Presidency. And to me, Europe looks like a Mexican army in which everybody is a general. In Europe, everybody is a president. And next to all these distinguished presidents, that is the higher representative of foreign affairs, who will be integrated, will be integrated in the Commission as a vice president. Now that by itself is already an improvement, because before, the high representative of foreign affairs had to share his policy area with the European Commissioner for External Affairs. So now we have Mr. Solana and Mrs. Ferrero Waldner, and he compete for the best seat at any international conference. Now these two jobs will be merged, and I think that's good. But the high representative, he is not, is not a European Minister of Foreign Affairs. He is simply one of the many players on the EU foreign policy stage. So he will become one of the fam famous coordinators coordinating other people. He wants to show presence, but he is not alone, because ministers of foreign affairs of member states also want to be present. And whenever there is an international conference or a major crisis, Europeans will have to charter a tourist bus for responsible dignitaries. So in the European foreign affairs ambit, there is too much symbolism and too little combined power. So in terms of institutional streamlining, which is my second point, Europe needed a profound shake-up, or rather a shake-out. And this has been omitted, and as a consequence, the system will remain to be top-heavy. The problem is not solved. Now, third of all, <coughs> does the text focus on a mission, on core tasks, on a mission in a limited, limited number of policy areas? Because the more Europe grows, the more it also should limit its policy areas, otherwise doing too much. Now, whenever Europe now touches you upon an issue, it tends to declare it European, and, try to, and, and they try to monopolize then it. And that is not the case. Not every issue is European. Some parts of the uh, common agri -pol uh, agricultural policy, the sort of the last part of planned economy in the world, um, the last some parts of this CEP, and particularly the social aspects of it, could be transferred back to member states. Why should Brussels do it all? Regional policy should, be f should only fo focus on the poor regions of the poorest member states. Now it also subsidizes poor areas in rich countries, which could help these regions more efficiently themselves. We should limit the mechanism of transferring money to Brussels to have it redistributed there on the basis of incomprehensible rules and guidelines. The Commission is good at legislation, as I pointed out already, but it is notoriously bad at managing projects. And if you do not believe it, just ask people who submit applications for projects. I've seen many of them. And they are so time-consuming and frustrating that I myself would never do it and never ask for money in Brussels. So why not helping economic sectors or regions and in innovative research with generous tax cuts instead of subsidies being pumped around? So the Commission is a good lawmaker, but a bad project manager. It should focus on the first domain and display self-restraint in the second. So the Commission should focus on core challenges, also when some new ones arrive. And I have to say, I am glad the new treaty sets out a common policy for energy independence and labour immigration. 
And I think in both areas a common approach is long overdue. How can Europe proclaim an independent foreign policy if it is completely dependent on gas from Russia and oil from the Gulf? How can we speak with a free voice in world affairs if we have to kiss the boots of Mr. Putin and the sandals of Arab oil sheikhs? How can Europe maintain a competitive economy while its populations are aging and high-skilled workers are in demand? So my criticism here is that the Commission is not bold enough neither on energy independence nor on immigration policy. Now, for example, the Green Paper of the Commission on Energy Policy, for example, does not even mention the word nuclear power as a part of a possible energy mix to achieve more independence. So I have to say that we move forward, but the pace is too slow. Unfortunately, the world moves faster. Now, the final question is, does the treaty reconnect Europe to its citizens? And I'm afraid it will not. So look at the reformed Union, European Union from a public perception, so not from within as a Mandarin, but from a citizen in this hostile world. And ask yourself whether your image or whether the image of the European Union would be improved on three parts of the perception which are dominating. And they are, first of all, the point of Brussels bureaucracy, Secondly, a fear for endless enlargement. And thirdly, the estrangement from the citizen. Now, first of all, the bureaucracy, as I already pointed out, the organizational streamlining remained too limited and too late. The, the Commission will only be sized down in 2014, and the European Parliament remains a full employment act for politicians. Anodyne agencies and bodies keep on growing like plants in an English garden. So the perception of the behemoth will not be taken away, I'm afraid. And secondly, a very important point is enlargement. Now, over the past five years, the European Union has enlarged at a huge page, pace. Twelve countries have joined, and that was right. I support it. Europe had to be reunited. But the EU has reached the, limit, uh, the, limit, the limits of its absorption capacity. If it enlarges too fast, and too far, it will collapse. Many citizens fear the entry of Turkey, and many observers regard it as a bridge too far. And perhaps the EU should stop enlargement after the accession of Croatia altogether. Instead of importing instability by speedy enlargement, the EU should exp export stability by extending its concept of the internal market to regions like the Balkans, North Africa, countries of the Middle East, Eastern Europe, and the Caucasus. The concept of the internal market enshrines free trade, free markets, and free entrepreneurs. What these regions need is free trade with Europe, and above all, among each other, which is very often the biggest obstacle. Free trade zones would energize their economies and produce growth. Too big a European Union would result in stalemate, gridlock, and demise, which would put all of us into uh, to the losing uh, end of history. So I say stop extending the European Union, but extend its concept and philosophy. Create an associated space of free trade and free markets. But instead, as we see now, the EU simply continues talking to Turkey as if membership is only a matter of time. Now, thirdly, the estrangement from the people. And this is my last point. The current treaty continues bad habits. The European Union is not underpinned with popular support, and citizens are left in the cold. Top leaders keep on appointing each other. The heads of government appoint a European president. It's very strange. An American president is elected, and even an almighty Russian president pretends to face the ballot box, as we see now. It does not happen in Europe. Only the European empire and the Chinese empire select a president by cooptation. So no wonder, because they are both run by mandarins. Now, heads of government equally appoint the president of the European Commission. The national governments appoint the commissioners, who then appoint heads of agencies and of uh, executive bodies. The European Parliament is elected once in five years, but the turnout has collapsed to less than 50%, and in some countries to 